The private space race has been on for a while now. The attention has been on SpaceX and Blue Origin with their reusable rockets. But there's one private space program that's been doing things a little differently. Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic isn't building rockets at all. It's building spaceships. Amid the loud rivalry between Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, amid the extravagance of self-landing rockets and other displays, Virgin Galactic achieved something that no other private space company ever has. In 2014, it became the first to put an actual person in space on board its Spaceship One, turning its pilot into an astronaut. And then, on February 22nd, 2019, the VSS Unity reached space in a suborbital flight, carrying the first ever passenger astronaut on a private spacecraft. The attention of space nerds everywhere, long distracted by the self-landing rocket club, suddenly turned back to Virgin Galactic. Questions abound. Is there a future in these strange air launch spaceships? Why is Richard Branson building spaceships at all? And what other mad schemes lie in the future? And most importantly, when can we go up? Obviously, these are questions probably best answered by Richard Branson. Now, in classic eccentric billionaire style, Branson spends much of his time on his private island in the British Virgin Islands. But by strange chance, through a series of unusual events, I found myself on that island. And it's a long story for another time. But I took the opportunity to sit Sir Richard down and blast him with questions. This was all a little impromptu, so please bear with the audio. So congratulations are in order. VSS Unity spaceship to successfully kiss space uh, December 13th. Uh, that must have been incredibly exciting, a, a huge milestone in a very long project. Um, yeah, thank you. It was not only exciting, it was quite a relief because ah. um, we, we, you know, it has been 14 years of, um, of tears and joy and it was just fantastic <laughs> that uh, our two wonderful now astronauts mm -hmm. managed to get into space and we've got another, another test flight just coming up and then you know, there'll be a couple more test flights then we'll move the, the, the whole operation to New Mexico where we've got this beautiful spaceport and yeah I'm hoping to go up in, in July and then have many others who've signed up can go up in the years to come. Well, I would say that's brave of you for proving the reliability by going up yourself before sending other people up, but I a feeling you wouldn't miss it. <laughs> the reason we, we, we built a spaceship, a spaceship and a spaceship company was because I wanted to go up. Okay, wanting to go to space is a pretty good reason to build a spaceship, but Richard followed up with what sounds closer to his true motivation. Everybody I know who's been, been into space has said it was um, earth changing and to be able to be in space looking looking back on it. There's a lovely book called The Overview Effect, which is interviews with all these people who've been into space. And also space, I think, can do a lot to protect the Earth. And you know, we're also going to be putting up like, big arrays of satellites around the world to connect people who are not connected. And those satellites can check out on illegal fishing boats that are ravaging the ocean. We can start monitoring the reefs in a systematic way. There's an awful lot of good that has already come out of space and will come out in, in the years to come. This is a stark difference to the motivations of Musk and Bezos, who have talked many times about the importance of an interplanetary humanity. They want to colonize the worlds. Branson, it seems, wants to save this one. Well, that sounds noble, but if you've been following Virgin Galactic at all, you'll know that its business model is to sell tickets for rides into space. Your first strategy, though, has been space tourism. Uh, can you say something about why, why, why this is clearly the first kind of you know, commercial approach uh, in your mind? And there's only been since um, space travel began about 500 people who are astronauts who've had the chance to go to space. Um, um, you know, we believe that if we can get the price at the right level, that there are thousands and thousands of people who'd love to become astronauts. And I think that can, you know, if, if, we're, if we're right about that, we can build more and more spaceships, and that means we can, um, we, you know, we hopefully can generate uh, funds where, where we can then start thinking about point-to-point -point travel at, 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 at great speeds. 
and overriding all of this, you know, both space and point-to-point -point travel and satellites in space is uh, a desire to bring the environmental effect down to an absolute minimum. Mm -hmm. So we can put somebody into space for about the same environmental effect of sending somebody one person on a plane from London to New York and back. And because we're air launching our rockets to put satellites into space, that you know that's much more environmentally friendly than a big jump rocket on the ground mm -hmm. going to space. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, the space planes are intrinsically more science fiction than rockets, and, and I think they're inspiring in that sense. And I love these images of Spaceship One and Spaceship Two dro dropping off and then flying up. Uh, I think somehow if, you, if, yeah, if you're going to go into space, you should be on a spaceship. <laughs> Let's take a look at what humanity's first private spacecraft looks like and why it might be the solution to affordable space access. This is the VSS Unity on its second trip to space on February 22nd. Unity is dropped at 15,000 meters by its carrier, White Knight, after which it blasts its rocket engine, sending it into a suborbital flight. Unity's first two space flights took it to around 83 and 90 kilometers, respectively. For reference, 80 kilometers above sea level is the boundary of space used by the US. This is still below the 100 kilometer Kármán line, an alternate definition to the space boundary. But Unity is designed to hit 110 kilometers in standard operations. After a few minutes in space, the craft re-enters and lands. It never reaches orbital velocity, so its low-speed re-entry is less fraught than, say, the Space Shuttle. Unity is actually the second of the Spaceship Two class space planes. The first, Enterprise, was lost along with one of its pilots in a tragic crash in 2014. The previous generation, Spaceship One, was actually the first private piloted craft to cross the Kármán line in 2004. There is some incredible engineering genius behind this craft, most of which is thanks to aerospace engineer Bert Rutan. But the key innovation is the whole air launch thing. It's worth a quick word on. Obviously, the space plane itself needs less fuel than a craft launched from the ground. But why is air launching from a plane more efficient than using booster rockets? Well, the real key is that planes are more efficient than rockets at low altitude. As well as a combustible fuel as an energy source, rockets need to carry an oxidant to burn that fuel and a reaction mass. That's what you blast out to propel the rocket forward. Planes, on the other hand, can use air as both oxidant and reaction mass. They only need to carry the energy supply, which is usually a combustible fuel, but could also eventually be electricity. In addition, an air launch craft can be optimized for the low pressure at that altitude, rather than have to operate at a range of pressures. Whether air launch can beat out reusable rockets for actually putting things into orbit remains to be seen, but the technique is looking great for suborbital travel. And this is what Richard means when he says point-to-point -point travel. These space-kissing trajectories could one day allow us to travel halfway across the globe in a couple of hours. Perhaps in the future, everyone who travels overseas will also become an astronaut. But I'm less patient than that. When do we get to go to space? There are 500 past astronauts. You already have a couple of hundred more than that signed up to fly to space. Uh, with Virgin Galactic. So you're going to more than double the number of astronauts that they were uh, in short order. Uh, but you know, there, there's a price tag, a quarter million dollar per ticket. Um, do you see this is something that the average person is going to be able to do? Yeah, I think um, if you compare it to commercial aviation, um, to cross the Atlantic in the 20s cost roughly the equivalent of a quarter of a million dollars today, over the hundred years since. Uh, the price has come down. So if we're right in um, believing that our spaceship company is going to, you know, can be successful and we can, we can attract people who are willing to pay the quarter of a million dollars that we currently charge, then you know, we, can, we can start building more and more spaceships. And as you build more spaceships, um, the price can start coming down. So you know, 25 years from now, I hope that a lot of young people watching this program will be able to afford to go to space and will become astronauts. And, mm. and that's, a, that's a very exciting thing for them to look forward to. Incredible. So there you have it. Maybe 25 years earlier, if you get rich, 
Richard Branson is 68 and has been waiting a long time for this, so I guess we can hold out a bit longer. Okay, so we have suborbital joyrides and saving the world by improving our access to space. But what about the far future? Richard shared a pretty unique vision with us. You know, my dream will be to maybe set up a Virgin Hotel, just um, either just off the moon or on the moon. Um, most likely just off the moon. You know, people who stay at our hotel will be able to, uh, you know, we'll have these lovely glass pods where they can see the moon clearly from, from their pods. And then we can have little spaceships that can, you know, whisk them around the moon and back in the evenings for dinner. You have um, these beautiful little electric buggies here on their <laughs> islands. Uh, they're fun. These would be yeah. <laughs> these would be yeah. So you could program it just to go you know a few hundred feet above the moon's surface. I'd love to dream in the years to come, uh, either ourselves or Elon or Jeff Bezos. You know we, we we will be looking at a deeper and deeper space exploration. But in order to afford that, we need um, we need thousands of people to be able to sign up to go into space and then we can use the resources to mm. um, expand into deeper space exploration. Absolutely. Well, Sir Richard, thank you for talking to us, but thank you mostly for dreaming <laughs> for us and with us. It could be a very exciting future. Yeah, no, it will be a very exciting future and thank you for inspiring inspiring us with your knowledge. It's fantastic. And He's the only person who calls me Sir Richard. Nobody else calls me Sir Richard. I always, I went, I've always, heard it once before when I was walking down a New York street. And I, I, uh, I, thought, I thought it was a Shakespearean play. I, I don't meet enough <laughs> nights. I'm going to call you Sir Richard. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Right. Thanks. Sir Richard Branson's long quest to send himself, and before too long many of the rest of us into space, is reaching its fruition, with lofty goals ahead. Branson has said that he'll go up in July, and while the first paying passengers aren't yet scheduled, presumably they'll follow when it's as safe as these things can be. Meanwhile, Elon Musk is hot on Richard Branson's heels. On March 2nd, SpaceX's Dragon 2 spacecraft made its first successful trip to space, and not on a suborbital trajectory, it actually docked with the International Space Station. This is the first private spacecraft designed to carry humans to make it into true orbit. Now, Dragon 2 didn't have passengers on this test, but in July, it will. The private space race is heating up. It's a hell of a time to be alive, watching humanity's first tentative steps off the Earth and into the fringes of space-time. Hey everyone, before we get to comments, I wanted to let you know about the new PBS Digital Studios show, Soundfield. Soundfield is a music show that gives a complete breakdown of songs and artists in every genre, from pop, classical, rap, jazz, electronic, country, rock, and more. And this week they have a very mathy episode on the Fibonacci sequence and golden ratio in music, and how it's influenced everyone from Bella Bartok to Queen to Drake. Alright, last week we explored the bad science of perpetual motion machines and announced the winners of the Perpetual Motion Challenge. Check them out, they're brilliant. Okay, let's see what you had to say. Hit and Miss Labs points out that atoms are perpetual motion machines, and there are hydrogen atoms that have been ticking for the entire age of the universe. Well, I guess you could call the atom the best possible perpetual motion machine of the third kind, the type that can keep on ticking without energy input or output. But even these eventually fail. Electrons escape their orbits by quantum tunneling, and protons themselves may eventually decay. Mark Siegel and Pieces of Cake Malek ask what if the cog part of the Brownian ratchet is in a vacuum? Now to remind you, the Brownian ratchet has this flywheel that turns a cog due to random motions of particles hitting the flywheel. And there's a latch that allows the cog to turn only in one direction. If the cog half of the device is at the same temperature or higher, it can be shown that it's just as likely to turn backwards as forwards when the latch raises. So, what if the cog is in a vacuum so there are no particles to turn it backwards? Well, the cog itself is made of particles that vibrate thermally. A device light enough to rotate its flywheel due to being hit by individual particles will also have a lot of internal thermal vibration. Even in a vacuum, that internal vibration is enough to randomize its rotational motion. In short, 
nature will always find a way to ruin our free lunch. A few of you chastised us for putting the Electroboom video that debunks perpetual motion machines alongside all of the other videos that actually claim to have built one. So yeah, we put a shout out to Electroboom's channel in text and we thought that that text made it clear that we think he's a genius and you should all watch his videos. Apparently that text wasn't clear enough, so let me say it again. Go watch Electroboom. A couple of you referenced Ginsberg's theorem, Allen Ginsberg's interpretation of the three laws of thermodynamics. It goes like this. Law one, you can't win. Law two, you can't break even. And law three, you can't stop playing. So you can't get energy from nothing. You'll always lose energy as entropy increases and you can never not have some entropy. In other words, you can never beat the house. But remember, the house is the entire universe. We can still win individual hands now and then at the expense of other players, like by stealing their aces, aka energy, and giving them your twos, aka entropy. And yeah, this is why we leave particle gambling metaphors to the great poets.